Okay, hi. Um, welcome back. And Happy New Year. I haven't been attending talks over the past three weeks. Um, had something going on on Sunday. But, but it's good to see all of you back. Um, not sure if any of you are new faces, but regardless. <laughs> um, my name is Karthik. I am a, I'm a graduate student and what I do is uh, I deal with uh, a small subset of artificial intelligence called deep learning and I apply that to medical image analysis. I am pretty new, I can't say I'm really new to the field. Um, I've been learning about machine learning for about three years and applying them since. Um, I was doing my undergraduate studies in mechanical engineering. I took a, a final year project in, in um, you know, data science and machine learning related, uh, related stuff. And um, I was applying these techniques for a while. I didn't, it, it's been quite an interesting journey because, you know, when you're learning about machine learning and, and deep learning, so many of these resources concerning how these things work, um, and, and, you know, all the way from the theory to the code is available on the internet. And it was just amazing to me that, you know, something that was considered so profound in the past, artificial intelligence, is actually so accessible to someone with a laptop or, you know, a low-spec computer. And I, I just felt that it would be interesting for me to talk about um, some of the techniques that I use in my in my research and just just explain how these things um, work very a very basic overview part of the other reason I wanted to give this talk was because um, in the past I've given a talk in the science circle about uh, computer vision that that is how computers perceive images how they classify images how they find objects like people and and cells and so on so forth in, in in images and i thought it would be interesting because i made a note about deep learning to talk a bit of you know to talk about it a bit more deeply um, and so just just to be a quick overview deep learning is a subset of um, machine learning which is a subset of artificial intelligence and and basically um, ai works to enable machines to to sort of um, copy human behavior so whether that's in things like uh, decision making or even our creativity, you know, that, that's what it tries to do. Machine learning is the subset of artificial intelligence that involves learning from data. And this presents a lot of unique advantages that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. And deep learning mimics or tries to mimic our neural behavior in order for us to learn from large amounts of data. And it has a lot of potential to, to, for both um, automation and data disco discovery. And I'll talk about this a bit more. But when we think about artificial intelligence, I think it's, you know, obviously the references that come to mind, immediately everyone's thinking about Terminator. And um, one thing I noticed that's very interesting is that we are all looking, um, thinking about cyborgs, um, the ones in Star, Star Trek, like, you know, the... Um, the bog. Uh, if you if you're like me and you've been watching Star Trek Discovery, uh, control was a topic that was mentioned in season two. Uh, Data has to be one of my favorite characters in science fiction, and he's always trying to to understand human behavior, human emotion. He's always trying to figure out things, and uh, it's it's just so interesting to me um, how these things have how these things have evolved in in media both you know in a, in a both a light-hearted manner and a, and a scary manner that gives people the impression that artificial intelligence is going to destroy the world and all this stuff but, but that's interesting and um this this talk basically aims to to talk about the basics behind these machines obviously these are very complex systems the ones that have been depicted in media um but through this talk, I hope to introduce some of the concepts behind um, image 
recognition, um, text recognition. Uh, you know how do how do these things understand uh, data? Um, the the words in our sentences per se. Um, how do these things manipulate them and then reproduce them? So um, I hope to introduce some of these concepts so these when you see these things in media, you understand them a little bit better. So this definition uh, was introduced by one of the pioneers in machine learning, uh, Arthur Lee Samuel in 1959. And he defines it as, you know, giving the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. What do I mean by this? In a traditional computer program, um, you would usually develop a set of rules. You would tell a computer to examine a problem and you would tell it, you know, uh, you would examine a problem, let's say, Let's give an example, um, spam recognition in your emails. When emails go to your spam filter um, or your, your spam mailbox, what normally happens is a computer tries to find out, uh, to, to apply a set of rules to the, the mail subject or the content of the mail, and then it sends it to the spam filter. So you could program this, right? You could tell a computer, Look, uh, in the email subject, I want you to look for certain malicious um, sets of text. Like, let's say, um, f loans or, or dollar signs. That's awkward, right, in, a, in an email subject. Or things like amazing and free, so on and so forth. And if you see, and, you know, you could tell a computer, if these things come up in the subject line, and if you see them, then send those emails to the spam filter. Now, obviously, you as the user, you as the developer of the program, you have to understand what these anomalies are. What are those things that defines what's spam and what's not spam? So you have to develop these rules, and then you have to tell the computer what they are, and then you have to tell them to automate this sort of filtering. But that puts a lot of load on you. That's a lot of data that you have to produce, a lot of data that you have to look for, a lot of data that you have to find. Maybe you have to perform a lot of surveys. You have to get it, you know, put down into an Excel sheet and then you have to upload that Excel sheet into the program and then you have to run that. And that's extremely time consuming. It's very resource consuming. And, you know, that by the time you've launched the program, you don't know whether it's even relevant because this data changes over time as people who send these spam emails become more smart and they recognize that you know you're not reading them your phishing emails might be the the subject lines might be updated the content might be changed so on and so forth these programs become irrelevant what if there was a way for us to automate this you know uh, development of rules and that's where data science comes in so you could take vast amounts of data, you could get them from the inter internet, you know, there's this big thing, uh, big thing called uh, big data that's going on now, right? And, and you could get these data patterns, you could basically um, survey people, um, you, you could get a vast amount of these spam emails coming in and, and you could feed them into a computer algorithm and you could have the computer learn from this large amounts of data um, what is it that people are putting into their spam folder and what is it that people are not putting into their spam folder and it could find those differences, you know, those nuances in the data that causes people to decide to, to, to put it in the spam folder or not in the spam folder and from that it could automate that, um, you know, that transference. And so this this use of data to learn patterns and to apply them to programs, you know, to examine problems, uh, that's what machine learning is, you know. So a very simple example of this is, for those of you who have done uh, some, I think maybe in high school science or before that even, there's some very simple experiments in things like velocity time where, you know, you would, um, lift a ball to a certain height and then drop it from that height and find out how long it takes before the ball stops bouncing um, loss of energy per se or you know how fast how long does it take for for um, a car to travel down a slope right so you release it and then you 
you let it go and then you find out how long it takes to travel from one point to the other. And you would record these data points on a graph graph sheet. Has anyone done this besides me? Can't be just me, right? And and you would record these points on a on a graph sheet and then you you would basically take a very long ruler, hopefully you had a 30 cm, 30 centimeter ruler, and you would place it and you would try to measure what's the best fit to to you know put these points you know in so that so that the that that line reflects the minimum distance between all the points to put together that error is minimized and what you were doing is actually what a lot of machine learning algorithms do which is called linear regression and linear regression analysis is basically the attempt to predict one dependent variable or target and a series, you know, from a series of other independent variables or features. For example, um, you, if you wanted to predict the the price of a house per se, you know, uh, you would take variables into consideration like the size of the rooms, you know, the um, and you could put these into a plot, and you could basically compare compare them. So the dependent variable would be the price of the house. The independent variables, so the, the features that you would use are the, the size of the rooms, the location. The lo um, location is a categorical variable, so you might assign a number, so on and so forth. But a computer is capable of processing these multiple sets of features and then determining which one contributes best to the um, dependent variable that's the, that's the price of the house. It's capable of automating this process for you. And you can use this for you know, various types of applications. You can use it for uh, prediction per se. In um, the midst of the COVID pandemic crisis, you know, um, some of the factors that would in influence the spread of the d disease, predictions regarding that, um, how, how many cases you would have in the future, so on and so forth. That sort of thing can be automated through these types of algorithms. What's also possible is classification. So you want to use a certain set of variables to determine whether a certain cancer belongs to a certain molecular class or a certain um, cancers are very heterogeneous. Um, they're very, they're very, they're very different subtypes in cancers. Uh, in in the one that I study, you know, like brain cancers, certain genetic subtypes, um, certain genes, the expression of certain genes would contribute to things like. Uh, whether or not the cancer responds well to radiotherapy or whether or not it, re it responds well to immunotherapy, uh, how long the survival of the patient, uh, what are the survival outcomes of the patient. And so um, survival outcomes would obviously be a regression problem, but whether or not the cancer responds well to radiotherapy or whether it responds well to chemotherapy, that's a classification problem. And so what you would do is you would then plot these features on, you know, axis and you would try to fit a certain model. A computer would try to fit a model. The attempt is on the, the leftmost picture to, to best separate these, these variables into different um, sort of clusters. So that in the future, when you have new data and you want to classify uh, a certain disease per se, or you want to classify um, even abstract things like um, animals or whether it's uh, it's a it's a it's a car it's a um, I'll talk about this a bit more later um, but but you know self-driving cars um, they they classify things like um, traffic signals traffic signals um, buildings so on and so forth so that's a classification problem there are two types of classification um, algorithms. One is supervised, that's the one on the left. It's where I've told the computer these are the classes, I want you to automate this classification for me and the one on the right is unsupervised classification. It's where uh, the computer finds uh, the mean correlations between the data, it finds clusters in the data, looks at where they are positioned in the plot and it tries to find these clusters on its own and it's very useful for data di driven discovery per se. The thing about this is, I've told the computer what what are the features that I want to use. Um, if I'm 
if I'm choosing, if I'm deciding on the price of a house, I would tell it that, you know, the, the size of the rooms are a feature that I want to employ. And so these, these um, or the location, the distance away from a train station, right? So, so these features are things that I have to know in advance. And so that, that manual input is something that I have to decide on. What if you have a lot of data features, like every column in this Excel workbook is, is a feature. And if uh, this was an example of, um, I think I was doing analysis on the cells in, in, in tissue images and I was looking at the things, the shapes like circularity and, and the size of the nucleus and all that. If a, if a nucleus in a cell looks very large or um, if it's very enlarged or it's very morphologically irregular, it's a very high chance that it's a cancer. So, so, so these features, you know, in every column, I, I'd be using them. And it could be a big headache for you to decide that these features are relevant to the final outcome. Um, that these features best describe whether or not it's a cancer or not a cancer, or whether it's not. A... And if you don't have an idea um, what's relevant and what's not, it's a big headache. And that's where we can use something like neural networks. And these things were basically inspired by um, the, the structures or the cells, the neurons in the animal brains. It's basically, um, there is a cell body and it contains a nucleus and most of the, the, the cells complex com components, there are these branching extensions, they're called dendrites. And then there's a very long extension called the axon. And so um, what basically happens is these neurons, they produce short electrical impulses called action potentials. And then these travel along the axons and they make the synapses release uh, chemical signals called neurotransmitters. And when the next neuron receives a sufficient amount of these neurotransmitters and then within what happens is very quickly it fires its own electrical impulses and so that travels you know through these neurons in the brain and these signals and and that that sort of that's how our thought process works so someone decided that um this person called frank rosenblatt he basically in 1957 he he thought let's let's try and make an artificial structure to to simulate this and that led to the birth of something called the perceptron. And it's one of the simplest structures in an artificial neural network. The way it works is it takes these, these inputs. And I told you about the, the inputs, like the, how, the, the size of the bedrooms and the housing price problem and all that. It takes these inputs and it multiplies them by a certain weight. Uh, it may make a guess at the start of the problem you know, as to what these weights are. It multiplies them by a weight, and then it adds them in a certain. Um, it adds them together with a certain bias, and then it releases an output, and it feeds that output to something that's called an activation function. So an activation function basically takes that output, and then it decides whether or not the neuron is fired or not fired. So um, if for example, the, you multiply the, the size of the bedrooms as a feature by a certain amount, or you multiply the distance from a train station by a certain amount, and then you add those two variables together, you get a certain, um, certain, you get a certain value. You feed that into an activation function. That basically decides whether or not the house is going to be maybe class one expensive or class two inexpensive. So that's a very simple, simple um, application for this sort of uh, uh, structure. But we could expand this, and I, I used this slide before, so the theme is a bit different, I apologize. But we could expand this into a neural network. This is what it looks like. And it basically tries to emulate a human brain's neural network. So the neuron, as I've explained it, is already, it's a mathematical function and it collects and classifies information according to a specific architecture. But what happens is in information is fed into these, these input layers. This is where you put those variables, your features, the housing prices, the, the cell morphology, the, the you know, um, 
various amounts of features can be can be put into this in input layer and that's transferred to a hidden layer where um, it's it's then multiplied by a certain set of weights the computer will alter these weights later on it makes a guess at the start and then a bias is added to every input after the weights are multiplied multiplied and depending or not on on the value that's output after you do this multi multiplication um, it's transferred into an activation function and that determines whether or not the node the next node will fire um, for feature feature ex extraction so um, basically what's going on is the computer is is trying to figure out uh, what those weights should optimally be for you to achieve a certain classification that corresponds to the classes that you have input so i've already told the computer this is based on based on variables like the cell size the the sum of uh the cell circularity the the maximum caliper of the cell which is like how much the cell is stretched or compressed i i basically told it that it is i told the computer this is either a cancer or not a cancer and so the computer will keep trying to adjust these weights and go back and forth uh, in this in this classification algorithm until it gets the class that I've I've uh, I've given until its its classification matches the classification that I've given. So it's a it, it's a little bit weird to to talk about this in a, in the format of data you know raw data just numerical variables. It's a bit hard for us to visualize what this actually is. But what if we applied the same neural network to something like images? What would the multiplication of weights look like in images and so um, images are obviously when when we input them into a computer we get this two-dimensional matrix so every pixel in an image corresponds to a number in the matrix uh, in this image matrix black for example could be uh, zero because it's the absence of color and white could be one per se or um, so so we could basically convert these things to numerical values numbers and from there we could then apply these things called convolutions which is the multiplication of certain um, operators to these to these images to highlight certain features so that weight that i was talking about earlier you know that's multiplied that w, the, the value of w that was applied earlier that would be a sort of a convolution in this in this case and what you see happening is um, in the first case, the first scenario, the, the, the top image, that convolution is highlighting the vertical lines in the image. So the, in, in our sign circle logo, we've applied this convolution and, and, um, on, and on the top, the, the top image, you notice that the, the vertical lines are highlighted. When we apply the bottom convolution, which is a different matrix altogether, you see that the horizontal lines in the image are highlighted. But what's the purpose of this, right? Well, if you think about certain images, the like, um, let's say we are comparing a giraffe and a human. What are the things that you will look for in a giraffe that's different from a, a, a person? The number of legs, for example, a giraffe has um, four legs, a human has two legs. So in a picture of a giraffe, you'd basically see a lot more vertical lines than you would in a, a picture of a human. So the top filter, the one that highlights the vertical lines, would contribute very much to the differentiation of a giraffe, a dog, a cat, or a human. And we could apply these convolutions to then mathematically differentiate what these two images are. A computer could use them. But if we don't know what these features are at the start, it's a lot easier for a computer to guess and adjust these filters accordingly, to just change those numbers and play around with them and go back and forth and back and forth until it manages to differentiate the pictures the same way we would. And so that's the power of a convolutional neural network. It's the power of a neural network that's applied to image classification problems. And this is what the, the architecture looks like. I realize it's a bit abstract. But 
broken down um, intuitively, this is what it would look like. Those lines that we saw earlier, the horizontal lines, the vertical lines, the dots, those, those things are low-level features. And as you add those features together, and as you go down the convolutional, the depth of the neural network, as you go down, those lines, those dots, those fixture, those um, circles, they translate to mid-level and high-level fe high level features like wheels, like legs, like ears, like a nose, a face, face, uh, facial feature. And that helps the computer to identify what the object actually is. And it's used in things like facial recognition. So when you use like Snapchat filters, right, and you want the computer to put a set of ears on your face, or it, it's a very popular thing in Instagram nowadays, right? So people are, are, are taking these um, pictures and then they are applying certain facial features like uh, the, the, the nose of a, 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 a snout of a dog or something to their, their face. How does the computer know where to put it on their face? It has to recognize where the nose is, where the ears are, where the eyes are, first of all. And th that's how these things work. Those low-level features that identify the lines, the dots and all that, they translate to higher-level features through the through the network and that helps you identify and differentiate those images um, the error in facial recognition i think what happened there was um, in encoded one one of the disadvantages of these neural networks is the data that we fit in has a very big um, impact on the outcome and so um, it's very much possible that that there was not a lot of training data for people with colored skin um, input into the algorithm for it to recognize that that was a human face which is which which is very you know sort of unfortunate um, a bias is what happens when you fit when you apply certain data sets uh, that have uh, that have that reflect our own biases inside let's say there's a lot more female employees hired than a lot more male employees hired by a company. And then you put this, this data and you tell the computer, okay, I want you to automate um, this uh, process of hiring. I want you to read certain data uh, in, in the CVs that are submitted by people. And I want you to decide based on that um, who to hire and who not to hire. Uh, one of the things that happened with Amazon was that when... Um, a lot of a lot of the training data didn't have um, in in the in the education portion of the the, the CVs. It didn't have a lot of names like uh, women's university, women's college, and so on and so forth. So when the computer was trained on this data and then it applied it to new data, new employees coming into the company, it hired very few female employees because the minute it saw. Um, it saw that the they came from a women's college or something like that. It, it didn't it didn't see that in its data set and it didn't fit them. Uh, it didn't believe that they were fit for hiring. So so these sort of biases that we have um, ourselves inherent biases can be exaggerated by computer systems and it becomes very dangerous to then then employ them, which is why it's so important for people to evaluate what these the data sets that these systems are trained on. And so going, you know, that, that leads us very much into the advantages and disadvantages. The neural network is able to automatically de deduce features from images. I don't have to tell it to look for a line, a dot. It does that itself. And it's basically applicable to several types of data and, um, you know, formats. Like the one that I've demonstrated here is images because I'm very familiar with that. I use it for image classification, but it's also applicable to things like um, text recognition. You know, there's something uh, called natural language processing where it's capable of not just deducing um, what certain words are, but based on the order the words are placed in sentences, it's able to generate its own um its own sentences, its own creative sort of poems and all that stuff later on. And so so it's not just, and it's also applicable to things like time series data, um, signal processing, 
uh, noise reduction in, in, in certain signals. It's, it's use, it can be used for several different engineering problems. And these architectures are also capable of being adapted to new problems. For example, these low level features that you see in the image here, you know, you need a lot of data to learn these features, these lines, these dots and all that stuff. But who said that if you are classifying cars, you can't use images from maybe animals, right? You could, you could, sometimes you look at the clouds in the sky and you say that, oh, that looks like a horse. That looks like uh, an elephant. That looks like uh, my my uh, dream car, Lamborghini. So so you know sometimes when we look at these clouds and we we see certain trends and we look we see we see certain similarities in the images. What's happening is that the shape of these things, you know, the lines, the dots, and all this stuff. That that's how we make these comparisons. And computers are capable of doing that. So there's this. Uh, mode of machine learning it's called transfer learning it's a type of deep learning where i take one problems train uh, a model that's trained on one problem and apply it to another problem so there's this thing called an image net database which has a lot of images of cars of animals of uh, objects like street lights and buildings and and all this data has been used to train some very powerful models and these models can be retrained, you know, using these basic level features to um, classify cancers and extract tumors and, or, 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 you know, it can be used for, for several different things, even in astronomy. I think um, what, she, what George does, you know, I, I would imagine that a neural network is behind the architectures that they use. But of course, the disadvantage is you would still need a good data set. Um, because it might extract the biases from the data set and exaggerate them, and then you would have a lot of ethical issues, and um, it would be very hard for clinicians and all that to trust uh, such a such a classifier. And it's not also easily interpretable. In these structures, um, the computer is making certain deductions on certain trends that it finds in the um, the data that's involved, but it's not exactly telling you what these things are. It's, it's hard for us to extract um, the learning process and understand how a computer is learning from, from the data that we've input. And so there are different, you know, sort of, sort of things that we, there are different sort of solutions that we can use to solve these problems. What I want to direct you to is at this point is this, um, this platform called Google Collab. I realize I should have gone into another slide first, but okay, first first things first. Um, these things require a lot of computational power. Um, that's one of the disadvantages. It requires a lot of data and a lot of data requires a lot of, uh, a, a lot of computational power to process. When I perform deep learning on my laptop, I think the GPU temperatures go up to about 80 to 90 degrees and that's extremely hot. Um, it's not comfortable to type on at that point and it really can damage your, your PC. So um, obviously, you, in order for us to get the computational power, we need, there are a lot of resources. And one of the big things is cloud computing these days. And this is accessible not just to me, but to you as well. Google Collab has provided um, this platform called Colab. And it's an environment that allows you to code these networks in Python but also learn from tutorials that people have publicly uploaded. And it provides GPUs, um, graphic processing units, um, for people to run this code. Their, their image analysis, their, their neural networks, their deep learning models, even machine learning models, using their computational resources for a limited amount of time. Obviously, there are, there are paid tiers later on, but you this is a very easy method for you to learn from this, these um from other people who have applied these models to use their algorithms to try them and to apply them to your own data science problems if you have them or to at least tell yourself hey i have applied artificial intelligence and it's not that far away it's actually accessible to a lot of people these days and that brings us to interpretability so the black box in artificial intelligence problems is something that we don't understand at this point 
um, it's something that we've been that people have been working very hard to unpack. In a convolutional neural network, um, all these convolutions are performed that transformations to the images that ultimately lead to you know making these images very diff um, differentiable in terms of their classes. And so you want to obviously the the question you want to ask a computer is what are these transformations you are making um, that leads to the outcome? What are the things that you are seeing in the data that leads to the classifications involved? And based on that, you are able to determine how, whether it's easy or not easy for you to trust the computer. And so there's, these, there's this thing called GradCam, it's called class activation mapping. It's basically where the computer tells the user based on a heat map that these features, these, these locations in the image is where I'm looking at to make certain classifications. It's where, it's, it's these locations that seem to possess the features like a face, like, um, like uh, the, the legs, the ears. And I've seen these things in the images and that seems to be making, that, that's how I've led to making this classification. That's how I've differentiated the images as a human and a dog, so on and so forth. And so you, you know, the Caltech has this data disco driven discovery institute where, where they do, they do data di driven discovery. It's one of the, one of the things that I've learned from deep learning algorithms is that the journey is more important than the end. And it's this process of making these convolutions that may help us find out new things about the data set that we didn't know before. There are actually, there might be these differences in the cancer images that, you know, we, we didn't know about that helps the computer makes a diagnosis that, that, um, that we've input. So this might help us learn new things about our data, new features, new, um, the, like there's maybe, maybe the, the cancer cells are, are clustering around a certain sort of neuron, a certain blood vessel. Maybe we didn't understand these things before because the data set was so large for us to take a look at all these images at the same time. And we might not have known that in advance. But by doing these things, by interpreting the, the, the journey the computer makes to, to, takes to make those classifications, it's possible for us to find out new things about our data set in the first place. And that might lead to discoveries. And that's, what ex that's what's more exciting to me. Rather than the process of automating Sorry, rather than the process of automating classifications, the discovery that's involved in the journey to making those classifications is something that I hope to explore more in my research. Another thing that's really interesting to me is the use of these algorithms to generate data. There's something called a general adversarial network, and it's a very interesting um, architecture it's, it basically involves two neural networks, two convolutional neural networks in this case, and they are playing a game with each other. So the one on the left, the one at the bottom left, that's called the generator, that's a deconvolutional neural network. And what it's doing, it's, it's taking random noise, which is like those, um, the images that you have seen, if you use a television and you do, you weren't getting signal uh, a signal and then you saw all these random pixels on the screen, that's random noise. And it would take that and it applies the deconvolution and it makes those transformations to the pixels until it generates an image. And that's fed into a discriminator. And you also give the discriminator real images. So real faces. Um, I know someone has done this with images of avatars in SL. There's a video, there are some fake videos of Obama making a speech that was done by the, these networks. And so what it does is, it, it, it's basically these two networks, the discriminator and the generator, and they're playing a game with each other. The generator is trying its best to transform the image until it looks like a real face. And the discriminator is, you know, trying its best to discriminate these images to, to be able to tell this is a real, this is a fake. And you know, computers are capable of generating their own images by by doing this, by playing this this game, this general adversarial network. And what I say next might be a bit dangerous, but <laughs> someone's actually used a neural network to even generate um, fake speeches. Um, so so this was this this is an example that's available on YouTube. You can watch it and have a laugh. 
a computer was you that uses a um, a neural a recurrent neural network was basically utilized in this sense, and they fed it a lot of speeches from from Trump transcripts from Trump speeches, and what the computer tried to do is it tried to generate a fake um, Trump speech. And and that's what its generational capabilities was. You know, you can listen to this. Uh, I think that you know the person delivering this is fantastic because he does a very good impression of Trump. Because uh, what really comes out of the computer sometimes is a bit nonsensic. It doesn't exactly. Um, I think Donald Trump makes a lot more sense. But uh, when he talks, but 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 yeah, it's it's funny. You can have a laugh. There are some um, nuances that seem to mimic the way he talks, and they they adjust its creative output. So, um, they make some alterations to to give it more room to be more creative in its speeches. And then towards the end, you will start seeing that it's actually spoken a lot of nonsense. But um, yeah, do check this out on YouTube. And when I think of uh, the way AI is depicted in the media, um, in games like uh, Detroit Human, uh, Becoming Human was an interesting uh, was an interesting game that depicted AI. One of the scenes that struck me most was of this android called Marcus. You know, he'd been he'd been living with this artist all for as long as he was purchased, and you know this guy asked him to draw something out of his own you know to be creative to 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 do a painting that he had never seen before and he was able to do that and it was uh, and it was amazing to me i think data tried this a lot of times also but i think that creativity is built on existing knowledge existing ideas existing um visualize visualizations of art and that's how we generate these new um, these, these new creative pieces that we haven't seen before and I think that computers today already have the potential to do that and so maybe it's not so far away that these scenes that you see in media in media it is so well um, illustrates the potential of AI you know these realizations are possible and with that I'd like to say um, yeah thank you I hope this presentation has been insightful. I hope it's given you a basic understanding of, uh, of you know, where we start with AI and where it can lead us. And yeah, I, I hope that when you see these uh, systems like Cybox, Androids and all that in media, you have some basic understanding of how the, how these architectures are built, where they start. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Is a hologram based on similar AI algorithms and viruses in this case? Well, it it depends on what part of the hologram you are discussing. Um, so, for example, Shiloh, um, if we looked at a, if we were talking about a hologram, the way a hologram is depicted, the construction of a hologram, what the hologram looks like, could be very much based on our own biases, because it could be constructed based on what people think is an attractive face, what is an attractive um, um, shape of a body, you, you know, those sort of things. So the visual depiction of a hologram, a person, uh, that that could be, if that is generated by, say, a gener generative adversarial network, then what that looks like ultimately is dependent on the data that we've input. So... If, for example, you know, there are how many of us in this uh, lecture theater about, is that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, I mean, yeah, if, if you, if a lot of avatars look like me, right, like mine, and you fed that into a computer system, uh, and you told that to, and you told it to generate a new holographic image based on, based on, 
uh, this is what humans look like. And if they look like me, the the ultimate the ultimately the generator product would look a lot like me. Chances are it wouldn't be female. So based on that data set, the generation of the hologram, that, that figure would look a lot like the images that you've input. Um, if you're talking about biases and discriminati discriminatory decisions, then there are various features, uh, there, there are various sort of technologies that are, that are used by the hologram. For example, it's able to see you, right? It's able to see a person. It's able to hear what a person is saying. It's able to transcribe that into text. And then from the text, it's able to extract certain, certain things. And then it's able to give responses. If you said that if a certain, if you gave it data, like um, for these sort of buzzwords or these sort of sentences that people have said, um, you know, it's, they are most likely to trigger anger. So uh, then, then you look into um, someone's messages, uh, right? You you look into messages that are sent by people to each other, and then you 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 look at them, and then you say that, oh, for these text messages, it seems as though someone is responding angrily, and then you tell that to a computer. So a computer will look for these uh, these sort of features in text, these um, the words that they've used, the phrases that they've used, and apply them, and then it would apply a bias. So the bias would be if it hears if it hears this text, it's going to get angry. I know it sounds very abstract. It's very hard to explain this, but but the point is when when we look at a complex system like a, a hologram, an android, um, it's important for us to break these down into their different components, components, their different features, um, responses to audio, responses to images, responses to touch, and uh, yeah. It's it's not just one algorithm that's applied. It's it's a lot of functions and a lot of a lot of um, a lot of data has to be used. A lot of different components. That it's better to break an engineering problem down into its in, its different parts and then talk about biases and discriminatory discriminatory um, decisions than to look at it at a whole. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Negative information is something I have a problem with in, in the media. And it's also something I want to complain about, um, you, you know, when we talk about our science circle discussions. I'm sorry to say this, but at our fireside, fireside chats, you know, we, we've always tended to end up talking about negative stuff in the media, negative stuff in the, that's coming out in the news, in, in newspapers and all that. Um, when you open it up, the first thing you see is a lot of articles talking about, uh, you know, the COVID situation and th this this minister is making that decision and this murder was committed. It's so much negative news that's coming out today. And I was thinking, I was just thinking about the Skynet situation in Terminator, you know, it, it decided that based, it was, it had access to information that was presented in the media, right, in news, that's proliferated through the internet, that's pro proliferated to, through social media. I wouldn't be surprised that seeing all this information and, and looking, you know, looking at it closely and looking at what people were posting and what was coming out that the human race was basically doomed for disaster. And then, then making the decision that it was better to just nuke the planet. Um, yeah, it's just the, um, yeah, it's, it's just how, how much, uh, how much of that is available. But of course, uh, Chantal, if you're talking about how it responds to information, that's, that's also different. For example, as a human, you might have a different emotional response to something that was negative and something that was positive. Maybe something that was negative gives you a stronger emotional response than something that is positive. Maybe you skim over those positive articles about, um, you know, this guy made a donation to a hospital or something like that. You know, you, you have your own biases. And so, obviously, computer systems, they, they can be trained. The weights can be adjusted. The weight is a very important thing. Um, so, 
let's say you want to give a pos- positive news article more weight than a negative news article, then a computer might might be able to adjust its biases accordingly. So I would think that it's possible to to sort of manually tune uh, the weights that are used in these algorithms to make it to make a computer respond to positive information more strongly than negative information. I I did want to think uh, I, I I have been doing a lot of thought about this about what's presented in the media what's on the internet and what a deep learning algorithm that has access to so much information so much big data data through a network a vast network you know would have access to but that also gets me th- thinking about um exactly what it is we are exposing our next generation through you know the generations that are exposed to media so much so much media proliferation through instagram through facebook through um you know snapchat or or whatever it is people are using these tiktok whatever it is people are using these days that exposure you know if we think about ourselves as neural networks as computer computers that are capable of picking up on biases and all that then what we are exposing the next generation to on social media and in our discussions at the science circle at our fireside set chats it's very important for us to consider this because if we feed them negatives if we keep discussing the neg- the negatives i know somebody said something about um the military being you know private and 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 all that yeah or people, people generally being aloof about the environment. People are like this. People are like that. That influences the biases that the next generation brings on. And you know how they treat each other, how they treat other people, how they treat problems that they may face. And so it's it's very important, just as a data scientist, as a data scientist, it's important for me to think about the data I'm feeding a computer. It's very important for us. To think about the the things that we are teaching, and yeah, I hope that through my presentations of, and I, I I have a lot to learn about presenting and all that, but through my presentations of technologies of of ideas of you know things that we have developed developed human ingenuity, I hope to point out that there is a lot of potential for us to address problems that are existing today, and it's accessible. It's something that we can play with something that you're never too it's never too late to learn how these things are applied and it's actually yeah i i just hope that as we go on through these talks um over the course of the year i suppose my resolution is to try and make it induce some positivity in our discussions and our um thoughts and uh eventually our thought processes Are there any other questions, any feedback, any thoughts? Um, do you think I could have been a lot more smoother? <laughs> yeah, some of it is a bit of a repeat the the deep learning portion i know somebody has uh, has given uh thank you thank you so much uh but i do hope we get more students participating in science circle talks eventually um i'm not sure if there are any graduate students or anything here now but yeah that it's a good opportunity for us to expand Thank you. This has been a privilege, as usual. Um, so I I hope that we'll have more talks about AI and programs and computer science and 
and things like that as we go on. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for coming, uh, for taking up your your evenings. I I hope you sleep well tonight. Um, not thinking about the dangerous potential of artificial intelligence that yes, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think with with some idea, some notion of how you know how much ingenuity that we possess uh that we've displayed over the past how much more we have to to show how much potential we have to solve the problems that are going on around us maybe my next talk should be about the pra practical ex applications of all of these you know um how it's being used in medical research how it's being used in uh, demographics and um, policy deduction and yeah it would be quite interesting to hear this but yeah thank you thank you so much I will turn off my voice Thank you.